It was a typical Friday night, and Sarah was getting ready for the party. Her best friend, Kate, had invited her to a house party that she'd been raving about for weeks. Sarah wasn't much of a party person, but Kate had insisted, saying this wasn't the type of party she wanted to miss. The house was in the middle of nowhere, perched on the edge of a thick forest that almost seemed to swallow the old mansion whole. The place had been vacant for years, but it had an eerie allure that made it the perfect spot for something memorable. Kate claimed that some distant relative had inherited the property and decided to host an event to breathe life into the old walls again. When Sarah arrived, the sun was setting, casting long shadows that crept over the building's edges. The front door creaked open before she even knocked. A man, who looked to be in his late twenties, with slicked back hair and unnerving dark eyes, greeted her. Sarah? He asked in a soft, almost whispery voice. Kate's been waiting for you. She nodded, offering an uneasy smile. Where is she? The man's smile widened, showing slightly too many teeth. Inside. Follow me. The house was even larger on the inside than it seemed from the outside. The walls were lined with dusty portraits of people long gone, their eyes following Sarah as she moved. The chandelier hanging in the entrance swayed ever so slightly, though there was no breeze. As they moved deeper into the house, the air grew colder. Sarah could hear the distant sound of laughter and muffled conversation, though something about it sounded off. The voices seemed too low, too soft. The laughter had no warmth. Finally, they reached a large room at the back of the house. It was dimly lit, with flickering candles placed on various surfaces, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. The room was packed with people, but no one seemed to be moving. They stood in small groups, murmuring among themselves, not really interacting with one another. Then Sarah saw Kate standing by the fireplace. She was talking to someone Sarah didn't recognize, but as soon as she noticed Sarah, her face lit up. She waved her over. Sarah, you made it! Kate said excitedly, though her eyes seemed strangely distant. Yeah, Sarah replied, glancing around. It's quite the party. Kate giggled, though it felt forced. I told you it would be different. She grabbed Sarah's arm. Come meet some of the others. Sarah allowed herself to be pulled into the crowd. The people Kate introduced her to were polite but strange. Their smiles never quite reached their eyes, and their conversations were hollow, devoid of any real substance. As the night wore on, Sarah started feeling increasingly uneasy. Something wasn't right. The people in the room barely moved. Every time she looked away from someone and then looked back, they seemed to be standing in exactly the same spot, holding exactly the same pose. At one point, she stepped outside to get some fresh air. The air was thick and still. The forest loomed ominously, the branches of the trees curling like twisted fingers. She felt eyes watching her, though when she turned to look, no one was there. She made her way back inside, and that's when she noticed it. The music had stopped. The conversations had grown quieter, almost to a whisper, and the people, they were all facing her, watching her. Not one of them was speaking now. They were just standing there, their eyes cold and unblinking. Her heart began to race. She scanned the room for Kate, but she was nowhere to be seen. That's when she felt the cold breath on the back of her neck. Sarah? She spun around, but no one was there. The air behind her felt heavy, like something was pressing against her something unseen. She took a step back, bumping into someone. It was the man from the door, his black eyes now locked onto hers. Kate wants to show you something, he said, his voice barely audible. Before she could respond, he grabbed her arm and led her deeper into the house, down a narrow hallway that seemed to stretch on endlessly. The deeper they went, the colder it became. She could feel the temperature drop with every step, her breath coming out in short, visible puffs. Finally, they reached a large wooden door. He pushed it open, revealing a small room lit only by a single candle in the center. Kate stood in the middle of the room, facing a large mirror on the far wall. She didn't turn around as Sarah entered. Kate? Sarah asked cautiously. Kate remained silent, her reflection the only thing moving in the mirror. It was then that Sarah noticed something wasn't right with the reflection. It wasn't copying Kate's movements. Instead, the reflection seemed to be watching Sarah, its eyes burning with an unnatural intensity. Sarah, Kate's voice was barely a whisper. I'm sorry, I didn't know. What are you talking about? 
Sarah asked, her heart pounding in her chest. Kate slowly turned to face her, and that's when Sarah saw it, the pale, decaying skin, the hollow, lifeless eyes. This wasn't Kate, or at least it wasn't the Kate she knew. I didn't know they were all dead, Kate whispered, tears streaming down her face. None of us knew. Before Sarah could react, she felt the cold hands of the man from earlier wrap around her shoulders. She tried to scream, but no sound came out. The room began to spin, and the walls seemed to close in on her. Everything went black. When Sarah awoke, she was lying on the floor of the room. The candle had burned out, and the air was thick with the scent of decay. Slowly, she pulled herself up, her body aching. She stumbled to the mirror, her heart racing. But when she looked into the mirror, she didn't see her reflection. Instead, she saw the room filled with people, people who weren't there. She was one of them now. The silent gathering had claimed another soul. Story number two. The old Victorian house at 19 Millstone Avenue had been abandoned for years. Its windows were boarded up, the, the paint peeling from its weathered facade, and the once immaculate garden had turned into a jungle of overgrown weeds. The townsfolk whispered about it, claiming it was haunted, that terrible things had happened there, but no one could say for sure what those things were. It was a place of dark legends, a place to be avoided, until one Halloween night when a group of five friends decided to change that. Ava, the fearless ringleader of the group, had a penchant for thrill-seeking. It's just an old house, she had declared earlier that day, waving off the concerned looks of her friends. We'll go in, have a few drinks, and leave. It'll be fun. Her friends, less convinced but unwilling to back down, agreed. They were young, bored, and eager for a night of excitement. So, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the town, they gathered at Ava's house, dressed in their best party attire, and set off for 19 Millstone Avenue. The front door creaked ominously as Ava pushed it open, revealing a dark, musty hallway. The air inside was thick with the smell of decay, and the only light came from the glow of their phone screens. Spooky, Jamie muttered, his voice betraying a hint of nervousness. Don't be such a baby. Ava shot back, leading the way into the heart of the house. They made their way to what must have once been the living room. A grand fireplace stood at one end, its stone mantle cracked and crumbling. Dust-covered furniture was scattered about, and a chandelier hung precariously from the ceiling. Ava dropped her bag on the floor and pulled out a bottle of whiskey and a few plastic cups. To a night we'll never forget, she toasted, pouring generous amounts of liquor for everyone. As they drank and joked, the tension in the air began to ease. The eerie silence of the house was replaced with laughter and music, their voices bouncing off the walls of the decaying mansion. For a while, it almost felt like a normal party, albeit in a setting straight out of a horror movie. But as the night wore on, strange things began to happen. The temperature in the room dropped suddenly, so much so that they could see their breath in the air. A low, rumbling sound echoed through the house, as if something large and heavy was moving just beneath their feet. The lights on their phones flickered, and the music distorted into a garbled mess before cutting out completely. What the hell was that? Lucas, the most skeptical of the group, asked, looking around nervously. Probably just the house settling, Ava replied, though her confident demeanor was beginning to crack. It's old, remember? But the others weren't convinced. Sophie, who had been quiet most of the night, suddenly spoke up. I don't like this, Ava. I think we should go. Before Ava could respond, there was a loud crash from somewhere upstairs, followed by the sound of footsteps. Heavy, deliberate footsteps that seemed to be coming closer. The friends froze, their hearts pounding in their chests. Someone else is here, Jamie whispered, his eyes wide with fear. Ava grabbed a flashlight from her bag and pointed it towards the doorway. The beam of light cut through the darkness, revealing the empty hallway beyond. The footsteps grew louder, echoing through the house like a death march. Maybe it's just the wind, Ava suggested weakly, though she didn't believe it herself. Suddenly, the footsteps stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. The friends stood huddled together, barely daring to breathe. And then, without warning, the door to the living room slammed shut, plunging them into complete darkness. Sophie screamed and the group scrambled to the door, but it wouldn't budge. It was as if something on the other side was holding it shut. 
Panic set in as they pounded on the door, shouting for help that would never come. We need to get out of here, Lucas yelled, frantically searching for another way out. Ava shone the flashlight around the room, her hands shaking. There! She pointed to a window on the far side of the room, its glass cracked but still intact. Without thinking, Jamie grabbed a chair and hurled it at the window, shattering the glass. Cold air rushed in, carrying with it the scent of wet earth and something else, something foul. One by one, they climbed through the broken window and out into the night. They ran blindly through the overgrown garden, not stopping until they were well away from the house. Panting and shivering, they huddled together on the sidewalk, the dark shape of 19 Millstone Avenue looming behind them. What the hell just happened? Sophie gasped, her voice trembling. Ava was silent, her face pale. She opened her mouth to speak when she noticed something, a shadow moving in the upstairs window. She pointed, and the others followed her gaze. There, silhouetted against the dim light of the room they had just escaped, was a figure. Tall, thin, and unmistakably human. It was watching them. And then it smiled. The friends stared in horror as the figure slowly raised a hand and waved, a mocking gesture of farewell. Without another word, they turned and fled down the street, not daring to look back. As they disappeared into the night, the figure in the window stepped away from the glass and turned to face the room. The door creaked open and five new figures entered, their faces pale and eyes hollow. They took their places around the room, mimicking the positions the friends had been in moments before. The house at 19 Millstone Avenue had claimed its guests and now it waited for the next group to come, eager for another party. Story number three. There was a house, an old one, tucked away at the end of a lonely cul-de-sac. It was the kind of house that kids dared each other to approach on Halloween, the kind with boarded up windows and an overgrown yard that suggested abandonment. Yet tonight, it was alive with the flickering glow of lights, laughter, and the sound of music reverberating through its hollow halls. Ava had always been curious about the house. She'd walked by it on her way to school, its dark silhouette looming in the background, whispering secrets she couldn't quite hear. So, when she received a text from her friend Liam, inviting her to a secret house party at the very same house, she couldn't resist. She arrived just as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, eerie shadows over the cracked driveway. The door was wide open, and as she stepped inside, she was greeted by the sight of her friends. Liam, Sarah, Emily, and a few others from school. The house was surprisingly warm, its interior a sharp contrast to the decrepit exterior. The music was loud, and the atmosphere was lively. Finally, you made it! Liam shouted over the noise, handing her a red plastic cup filled with some, some sort of punch. I can't believe you're throwing a party here, Ava said, looking around at the peeling wallpaper and faded portraits on the walls. It's perfect, right? No one else dares to come near this place. We've got it all to ourselves. Liam grinned, his eyes twinkling with excitement. As the night wore on, the party grew wilder. People danced, laughed, and drank, the house seeming to embrace the energy, its walls vibrating with the beat of the music. Ava, however, couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. She kept noticing things out of the corner of her eye, shadows that moved when no one else did, whispers that seemed to come from the walls themselves. At one point, she wandered away from the group, drawn to a staircase at the back of the house. The wooden steps creaked under her weight as she climbed them, the noise drowned out by the music below. The second floor was dark, only the faintest sliver of moonlight creeping through the dirty windows. She found herself in a long hallway lined with doors, each one closed, each one hiding something she couldn't quite place. Her curiosity peaked. She reached for the nearest doorknob and turned it slowly. The door opened with a soft groan, revealing a small room filled with dust and cobwebs. But what caught her attention was the large mirror on the far wall, its surface dull and streaked with grime. Ava stepped inside, her reflection barely visible in the dim light. As she approached the mirror, she felt a sudden chill, as if the temperature had dropped several degrees. She rubbed her arms, trying to shake off the cold, but it clung to her like a shroud. Then she heard it, a faint whisper, so soft she could barely make out the words. It was coming from the mirror, or perhaps from behind it. She leaned closer, her breath fogging up the glass, 
her heart pounding in her chest. Come closer. The voice was clearer now, and it sent a shiver down her spine. Ava took a step back, her instincts screaming at her to leave the room, to go back downstairs where her friends were. But something held her in place, something compelling and terrifying at the same time. The mirror began to ripple, as if it were made of water instead of glass. Ava watched in horrified fascination as her reflection warped and twisted, the image no longer matching her movements. Her reflection smiled, a cruel, twisted grin that sent waves of dread crashing over her. She tried to scream, but no sound came out. The mirror's surface bulged outward, and a hand reached through, pale and clawed, grasping at the air. Ava stumbled backward, tripping over her own feet as the hand reached for her, its touch icy and suffocating. Join us. The voice was all around her now, echoing in her mind, drowning out her thoughts. She scrambled to her feet, her breath coming in ragged gasps as she bolted for the door. But the hallway outside was different now, longer, darker, the doors on either side distorted and twisted. She ran, her footsteps echoing in the empty space, but no matter how far she went, the hallway stretched on endlessly. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, until they were all she could hear. She skidded to a stop when she saw Liam standing at the end of the hallway, his back to her. Liam! She called out, relief flooding through her. We need to get out of here. Something's wrong. But when Liam turned around, Ava's blood ran cold. His eyes were black, empty voids, and his mouth twisted into the same cruel smile she had seen in the mirror. Too late, he whispered, his voice not his own. The doors on either side of the hallway burst open, and shadows poured out, writhing and twisting as they reached for her. Ava screamed, turning to run in the opposite direction, but the shadows were faster. They enveloped her, pulling her into the darkness, their whispers filling her mind. Join us! Join us! The last thing Ava saw before the darkness swallowed her completely was her reflection in the mirror at the end of the hall, smiling, content, as if she had always belonged there. Downstairs, the music continued to play, the laughter and chatter of the partygoers oblivious to what had just happened. They didn't notice when Ava didn't come back. They didn't notice when, one by one, their friends began to disappear into the darkness of the house. And they didn't notice when the house itself began to change, its walls warping and twisting as if it were alive, feeding off the fear and despair that now filled its halls. By the time the last of them realized something was wrong, it was too late. The doors were sealed, the windows covered in a thick, impenetrable darkness. The whispers echoed through the empty rooms, growing louder, more insistent and the house, once silent and abandoned, was now filled with voices, countless voices, trapped forever within its walls. Story number four. Cassie's phone buzzed with a message from Mia. Party at the old Ravenswood Manor. You're coming, right? Cassie sighed. Mia had a knack for dragging her into strange, out-of-the-way places for parties, and tonight was no exception. Ravenswood Manor had been abandoned for years, surrounded by rumors of hauntings, disappearances, and unsettling occurrences. But Mia was her best friend, and Cassie didn't want to let her down. As she drove through the winding roads leading to the manor, the trees grew thicker and the sky darker. The radio in her car began to crackle with static, so she turned it off and continued in silence. The house soon appeared on the horizon, looming large and menacing against the deep indigo sky. It looked like something out of a gothic novel. Tall spires, broken windows, and ivy creeping up the stone walls. She could already see flickering lights inside, signaling the party was well underway. Cassie parked and hesitated before stepping out of the car. She was filled with an uneasiness she couldn't shake. It was just an old house, she told herself. Nothing more. She made her way to the entrance and pushed open the heavy wooden door. The party was in full swing inside, but everything felt slightly off. The guests were dressed in what looked like old-fashioned clothes, formal gowns, suits, and masks that hid most of their faces. The air smelled of something faintly musty, and the light seemed too dim, casting long shadows that writhed against the walls. Cassie searched for Mia, but she was nowhere to be found. Instead, a tall man with slicked back hair and a sharp smile approached her. You must be Cassie he said in a deep, soothing voice. Welcome. How do you know my name? Cassie asked, unnerved. Mia told us you'd be coming, he replied with a smile that didn't reach his eyes. She's around, 
you'll find her eventually. But first, enjoy yourself. The night is young. He stepped aside, gesturing for her to mingle. Cassie wove through the crowd, her discomfort growing with every passing minute. She noticed the strange way people were acting, stilted conversations, odd glances that lingered too long, and that eerie, old-fashioned music that drifted through the air. The longer she stayed, the more it seemed like these people weren't guests at a party. They were actors in some strange, twisted play. Cassie finally spotted a girl who looked like Mia, standing near a grand staircase at the far end of the hall. She hurried over, calling her friend's name. Mia? The girl turned, but it wasn't Mia at all. Her face was pale, almost translucent, and her eyes were cold and lifeless. I thought I saw Mia up there, the girl said, her voice hollow. She pointed to the top of the staircase. Cassie felt a chill creep down her spine, but thanked the girl and made her way up. The second floor was eerily silent, with long hallways stretching into darkness. Most of the doors were closed, except for one at the very end, slightly ajar. Cassie approached it cautiously, her heart racing with every step. She pushed the door open and found herself in what appeared to be an old parlor. The room was bathed in an odd blue light, and the air felt colder here. Sitting in an armchair near the window was a figure. It was Mia. Mia, Cassie exclaimed, rushing over. Where have you been? This place is freaking me out. Mia slowly lifted her head, her face expressionless. I'm sorry, Cassie, she whispered. I didn't know it would be like this. What do you mean? Cassie demanded, suddenly alarmed by her friend's strange behavior. They invited us, Mia said, her voice shaking. Must, but I didn't realize they're not like us. What are you talking about? Who invited us? Mia's eyes filled with tears. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have brought you here. I thought it was just a party until I realized it was too late. Cassie was about to ask what Mia meant when she noticed the mirror behind her friend. It wasn't reflecting the room as it should have been. Instead, it showed the same parlor, but filled with shadows, people that weren't actually there. She squinted, leaning in closer to the mirror. The shadows were shaped like the party guests downstairs, but they were all standing still, their heads turned toward her. Mia? Cassie's voice trembled as she pointed to the mirror. What's going on? Mia turned to look, her face growing pale as she finally saw what Cassie was seeing. They're the ones who live here, Mia whispered. The ones who never leave. We're just guests for the night. As Mia spoke, the door to the parlor slammed shut and the blue light in the room flickered violently. The temperature dropped even further and Cassie felt a strange pressure build in her chest. She tried to move toward the door, but her legs felt like they were glued to the floor. Mia, we have to go, Cassie urged, panic rising in her throat. Mia shook her head slowly. It's too late, they've already chosen. Suddenly, the mirror shattered, sending glass flying across the room. The shadows that had been trapped within it spilled out into the parlor, swirling around the girls. Cassie tried to scream, but no sound came out. The shadows began to take shape, forming figures with hollow eyes and ghastly smiles, their cold fingers reaching out toward her. She grabbed Mia's hand, desperate to pull her friend away, but Mia didn't move. Her face was blank, her body limp as if all the life had drained from her. Cassie felt the darkness close in, pulling her down into a suffocating grip. The last thing she saw was the tall man from earlier, standing in the doorway with that same cold smile. The next morning, the manor was silent once again. The partygoers were gone, the air still and lifeless. No one ever found Cassie or Mia, though their cars remained parked outside, covered in a thin layer of dust. Inside the house, the shadows waited patiently, ready for the next invitation to be sent out, eager for their next guests to arrive. Story number five. The old Jenkins mansion had always been a source of fascination for the townspeople of Darbyville. Sitting atop a hill, shrouded in mist and shadow, it was a relic of a time long past. Its windows were dark, its doors barred, and the surrounding grounds were choked with untamed foliage. No one dared to approach it, not even the bravest of the town's children, who often challenged each other to run up and touch its rusted gate. But that all changed one crisp October evening, when a plain, cream-colored envelope arrived in the mailboxes of six friends. The envelope contained a single, handwritten card, elegant in its simplicity. You are cordially invited to a private gathering at the Jenkins Mansion, October 31st at 8 p.m. 
your presence is requested for an evening of revelry and remembrance. Dress appropriately. No signature, no return address, just that chilling invitation. Ava, Sarah, Mike, Emily, Jack, and Ben had all received the same card. They had grown up hearing the stories about the mansion, how it was cursed, how the Jenkins family had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only whispers and unanswered questions. But none of them had ever believed the tales. It's probably just a prank, Jack said, turning the card over in his hand as the group gathered at Ava's house that afternoon. But hey, it's Halloween and we've got nothing better to do. Why not check it out? I don't know, Emily said, biting her lip. That place gives me the creeps. Come on, Em, Ben said, throwing an arm around her shoulders. It'll be fun. Besides, if it's a prank, we'll just leave. No harm done. Reluctantly, Emily agreed, and by nightfall, the six friends found themselves standing at the gates of the Jenkins mansion. The air was thick with fog, the full moon barely visible through the dense clouds. The gate, which had been locked for as long as they could remember, now stood open, as if beckoning them inside. This is weird, Sarah whispered, but no one responded. Ava, always the boldest of the group, pushed the gate open further and led the way up the overgrown path to the front door. To their surprise, the door wasn't locked. It swung open easily, revealing a grand foyer bathed in dim candlelight. The air inside was cool and smelled faintly of lavender and dust. Looks like someone's been expecting us, Mike said, his voice hushed. The foyer opened up into a large ballroom, where a long, polished table was set with fine china, crystal glasses, and silver cutlery. The table was laden with food, roast meats, fruits, and desserts, all arranged as if for a grand feast. At the head of the table was a large, ornate chair, draped with a deep red velvet cloth. This is insane, Jack said, his voice echoing in the vast room. Who would go to all this trouble? Maybe they want to sell the place, Ava suggested, though she didn't sound convinced. They wandered the mansion, marveling at the opulence and the strange, untouched quality of everything. It was as if time had stopped within these walls. But there was an odd feeling in the air an undercurrent of unease that none of them could shake. As they explored, they began to notice something strange. Each room they entered seemed to be an exact reflection of their childhood memories. The games room, where they had played hide and seek as children, the library, where they had sneaked in to read forbidden books, even the attic, where they had once dared each other to spend a night. Everything was exactly as it had been in their memories, down to the smallest detail. This can't be possible, Emily said, her voice trembling. We've never been inside this house. How could it know? Maybe we're just remembering wrong, Ben said, but his voice wavered. The clock struck eight, and suddenly the door to the ballroom slammed shut. The friends jumped, their hearts pounding in their chests. Ava ran to the door, but it wouldn't budge. Okay, this isn't funny anymore, she said, panic rising in her voice. Just as she spoke, the candles in the room flickered, and the food on the table began to spoil before their eyes, the roast turning gray, the fruits withering, the desserts crumbling into dust. The air grew colder, and a low, melodic hum began to echo through the room. What the hell is happening? Mike shouted, backing away from the table. Suddenly, the large chair at the head of the table moved. Slowly, as if pushed by an unseen hand, it turned to face them. The velvet cloth fell away, revealing the decayed form of a man, dressed in the finest attire of a bygone era, his hollow eyes staring straight ahead. Emily screamed, and the group backed away, pressing themselves against the walls of the ballroom. The figure in the chair opened its mouth, a dry, rasping sound escaping its lips. Welcome, it croaked, its voice like the rustling of dead leaves. We've been waiting for you. The humming grew louder, and the walls of the ballroom began to close in, the room shrinking around them. The friends screamed, but their voices were swallowed by the darkness that descended upon them. In the morning, the town of Darbyville was abuzz with the news. Six teenagers had gone missing, last seen entering the old Jenkins mansion. Search parties scoured the area, but no trace of the teens was ever found. The mansion, however, stood as it always had, silent and imposing and if one were to look closely at the window of the grand ballroom, they might catch a glimpse of six new figures sitting around the table, their faces pale and eyes hollow, as if waiting for the next invitation to be sent out. 